So I'm going to get started now at 3.05. My name is Brian McGuire. I am the uh, an Associate Professor of English, uh, the current chair of the English department. And why I am hosting this event right now is I am the Teaching and Learning Fellow through the LASH Center. The LASH Center for Teaching and Learning at Bristol is the organizing structure of these academic lectures, which have been off to a fantastic start this particular year. And I am really excited about today's presentation um, with, uh, with Eddie Guimont. I'm gonna introduce him right now. Just give me one second to bring up the screen here. Um, Eddie Guimont was hired at Bristol in fall 2021 and is assistant professor of world history. He earned his PhD at the University of Connecticut his dissertation was on the role of pseudo-historical narrative in settler colonialism using the city of Great Zimbabwe as a case study. Today's presentation is titled The Flat Earth, Global History. And again, this is just something that I think is, is so interesting and, and intriguing to me. And I, I've really been looking forward to this. And so now I turn the, uh, the spotlight over to Eddie to lead us. Thank, well, thank you, you very much. All right, let me bring up my screen. Let's see. Okay, is that visible? Look good? Yes. All right, perfect. So uh, thanks, uh, Brian, for that great introduction. Uh, Eddie Guimont, Assistant Professor of World History, new hire as of last year, but first full year here at Bristol. Uh, and as mentioned, you know, my background, I was as a, a PhD in history from UConn. My dissertation was on the city of Great Zimbabwe in what was at the time, at least for most of my dissertation, uh, the colony of Southern Rhodesia is now the country of Zimbabwe. It was in fact named after uh, the city. But uh, from my research for my dissertation, uh, this is kind of a spinoff of that, although in a somewhat roundabout way. So, you know, I didn't really focus on the history of science for most of my dissertation work, but stumbled into it as kind of a spinoff, uh, particularly uh, as we'll come to see, there's a South African component to the flat earth uh, historical narrative, uh, which I had not heard of before, but I stumbled upon it while doing work on my dissertation around the same time that uh, in the news, there were figures like uh, Kyrie Irving, uh, the rapper Bob, who are getting into arguments about the flat earth with Neil deGrasse Tyson. So it seemed like you know, there was something happening in the air at the same time as uh, I was finding this in my dissertation. And so a couple of years later, after I you know, successfully defended the dissertation and was looking for a new project, this kind of emerged as my big uh, a new research focus. Uh, so you know, at this point now, I have you know, several hundred pages of notes that hopefully in the coming year, I'll start turning into an actual thing to get published. Hopefully, someone will be interested, but at the very least, uh, certainly, uh, uh, it's been keeping me occupied. But that being said, I think it's useful to kind of focus on you know, what the flat Earth is. Uh, you know, at, at its core is the idea that the Earth is not a globe, that the sun, you know, does not, uh, that the Earth does not orbit around the sun, but the sun and the rest of the universe orbit around the earth. This is, you know, of course, you know, not uh, uh, true, uh, just to make sure we're all in the same sense there. Uh, the size of the earth, the shape of the earth, and actually the distance between the earth and the sun were all determined uh, at the Library of Alexandria by Eratosthenes, uh, other philosophers, particularly Greek, but uh, Babylonians also, even before then, had determined the spherical nature of the earth and actually pretty accurately the size of the earth as well. So the idea that, you know, thousands of years ago, people thought the earth was flat for most of, you know, Europe, North Africa, the Middle East, uh, Asia, this was really not true. And a lot of times also, you know, you'll talk, you'll hear people mention that the, you know, the church thought the world was flat, which we'll get into in a bit. This is really not you know, true either. Uh, even during the so-called Dark Ages after the fall of the Roman Empire, there's not really any uh, uh, people who you know, are at least people in the historical record. Of course, those who haven't left records behind, we don't know, but at least among literate people who left records, there's never really any serious belief that the earth uh, is not spherical. Uh, now, the, the question about uh, geocentricity is a bit different, which we'll talk about, but at the core, 
even for religious people, you know, for the past thousand, two thousand years, there's not really any question. Uh, but the flat earth idea itself, especially as it's emerged recently, uh, this is not a scientific, you know, debate really. It's a religious debate. Uh, uh, people find comfort in the idea that the earth is at the center of the universe, especially because it argues not only that there's a uh, you know, a focus of humanity, but it implies the existence of a creator as well. And so this is something that we'll see throughout a lot of the flat earth narratives that at its heart, it's really a religious view, which is also why it's so kind of troubling to debate flat earthers, or, you know, try to use evidence to debunk this. I mean, like this, you know, post here says I'm a flat earther, but I don't believe the earth is flat. That's not the point. That seems kind of contradictory, but uh, and when you look at it as that kind of religious view, that helps to explain it a bit. Uh, now, if you're interested, there are kind of th three key resources. You know, uh, obviously there's hundreds, thousands of other you know primary documents, but in terms of you know comprehensive secondary sources that summarize the history of the flat Earth idea, these are really the three key ones. Uh, Jeffrey Burton Russell's Inventing the Flat Earth uh, from 1991 is a history of uh, what he calls the flat error, which is how, you know, the idea we have that in the Middle Ages, people thought the earth was flat. So Russell's book is really a look at how that particular narrative emerges. And we'll come back to that uh, in the next slide. Uh, Christine Garwood, who's a historian of science, uh, her book, The Flat Earth, uh, The History of an Infamous Idea, she publishes that in 2007. This is kind of a basic overview of just more broadly the notion of people who believe the earth is flat. So uh, she uses Russell as a source, looks at some of it, but whereas Russell is really interested kind of only up till the 19th century or so, Garwood brings us into uh, the modern day or at least up to what was the modern day at her point. Because by 2007, the idea of a flat earth had kind of, you know, uh, gone into its, you know, one of its very low points. And so when uh, Garwood writes it, it's comprehensive up to at least 2007. You know, right after that, a few years is, or actually two years before she writes the book is the launch of YouTube. And it's YouTube that in the early 2010s is really responsible for the current flat earth uh, renaissance. And Kelly Weil, who's a journalist, her book Off the Edge, which is very new. Uh, officially, it just came out yesterday, but uh, the library had a copy, so I've been slowly reading through that. This is a book that, uh, although it does have a bit of a historical view, it's much more uh, comprehensive and about the modern flat earth movement that's really been existing since around 2014, 2015. She has a lot of interviews with you know, a lot of the leading flat earthers uh, of the current moment. So between these three texts, uh, these are basically you know, good overviews if you're interested in not just the history of uh, the idea of the flat earth, but the historiography of the flat earth. Uh, but in particular, uh, Russell, probably the most, uh, I think, interesting and certainly the most in-depth of these, and his role is on documenting the flat error, which as mentioned, is the idea that you know, in the Middle Ages, people thought the world was flat, the Catholic Church thought the world was flat. Columbus was this brave pioneer who, you know, proved the Earth was round, and that therefore, you know, Columbus is this, you know, scientific pioneer who, you know, drove back the Dark Ages by discovering America. Uh, in his research, Russell points out that this idea really originates, you know, essentially it comes out of Washington Irving's 1828 uh, biography of Columbus. Uh, and this plays a particular role in American culture at the time. This is the era when there's a lot of rising fear over Catholic immigration coming to the United States. And so Columbus, who you know, at the time of the American Revolution was a very minor figure for you know, the founding father's generation, they would not really have looked to Columbus as uh, certainly not as an icon of you know, the emerging United States. Columbus in Irving's account gets transformed into not only this scientific figure uh, who you know, proves uh, the earth is round in contrast to uh, the Catholic church, but by you know, pioneering this you know, supposed conflict with the Catholic church, Columbus is turned into this kind of proto-Protestant figure as well. So 
by turning Columbus you know, into this guy who rejected the idea of the flat earth, it means that the discovery of America by Columbus, even though that's very ahistorical for a number of reasons, Columbus's discovery of the America is not only a scientific act, but a Protestant act, which therefore turns America into this implicitly progressive, scientific, Protestant country. And, you know, the idea that Columbus was a Protestant, anyways, you know, that's very funny on, on many levels. But this essentially is the origin of a, uh, the flat air of the idea that, you know, Columbus proved the Earth was round for the first time. Uh, now, what's ironic about this is Columbus's methodology did have some similarities to modern flat earthers because Columbus actually argued that the earth is much smaller than uh, uh, it was commonly accepted at the time. This is a map of uh, uh, the earth uh, as Columbus thought the distance was. Uh, and he uses you know, uh, Toscanelli's world map, which is you know, not really accepted, but this on the left, Cathay is China. So we can see Columbus thought that essentially you could reach China just around you know, where, the, you know, where the Americas is now. Obviously, if the Americas were not there, Columbus would have, his whole crew would have died in the middle of the ocean. So he's very lucky that his uh, uh, revisionist take on the size of the earth uh, uh, was wrong. And this actually impacts him a lot because he initially goes to the Portuguese crown to try to get funding to go across the ocean. The Portuguese you know, uh, navigators look at Columbus's argument about you know, the size of the earth, and they know that he's wrong. So they reject funding him because they see that you know, this, it, it, it's a crazy map that you know, this guy is trying to use. And so Columbus turns to the Spanish crown precisely because uh, his own beliefs of the size of the earth are rightly rejected by the Portuguese. Uh, and from this, I'm going to take a, a small tangent not directly related to the flat earth, but it is related. It's the one of two uh, local history things I can connect here. So uh, I'm gonna briefly talk about a local doctor, Manuel Luciano da Silva, who is a Portuguese doctor, a medical doctor who after World War II emigrates to Bristol, Rhode Island. From the 1960s on, uh, da Silva heavily promotes the idea that Dighton Rock up in uh, Berkeley uh, was carved not by you know Native Americans. For those who don't know, this was a large boulder in the I think it's in the Taunton or was in the Taunton River that at low tide there are pictographs visible on it. Most historians, archaeologists will say this is you know Native American pictographs. That's not super uh, uh, in question, but to to the History Channel types will say you know obviously Native Americans could not have you know drawn on a rock so. This is variously interpreted as, you know, Phoenician explorers, Viking explorers. But since Da Silva was Portuguese, he comes across the idea that Dighton Rock was carved by Portuguese explorers in the early 1500s. And it's Da Silva who plays a leading role in uh, creating the Dighton Rock State Park. Uh, and hence why if you go and see the Dighton Rock State Park now, the exhibits there explicitly advance uh, his view that Portuguese explorers drew this. Uh, a view, again, which is not held by any mainstream historian, I think is also you know, at this point, and you know, we have so many debates over the teaching of public history in the United States, worth you know, keeping in mind that the effect of public advocacy, especially because this was promoted by politicians who wanted to get votes from the local Portuguese community, uh, tended to advocate this. So an interesting look on uh, the role that, we'll say, interested lay people can have on political interpretations of history. Uh, but I bring this up because not only did De Silva think that Portuguese explorers carved Dighton Rock, he also believed that Columbus himself was actually Portuguese, that Columbus had secretly been uh, born in Portugal, and that Columbus's real name was Salvador Fernandez Zarco, and he changes it to you know, Columbus to hide his Portuguese heritage. Uh, so this is uh, De Silva. On the left here, this is his uh, him on the cover is uh, on the cover of his book uh, next to the statue of Prince Henry the Navigator in downtown Fall River, and actually of note, uh, the Bristol Library has an autographed copy of this book. So, uh, if any of you are interested, uh, a lot of interesting other theories uh, he expounds upon in this work. But uh, again, not directly related to the flat Earth, but since it has to do with Columbus and interesting uh, perceptions of history and a local figure 
thought I would uh, bring it up itself. But to, to return safely, you know, uh, back over the edge to the flat earth, uh, the essential, the key takeaway of uh, the idea of the flat earth is you know, for the past more than 2000 years, in some of these cases, the vast majority of educated Jewish, Christian, Muslim, we can add Greek, also Phoenician persons have known the shape and general size of the earth from the origin of those beliefs, although geocentrism uh, was a major erroneous belief, but size of the earth, earth and shape of the earth, not so much. But starting in the mid 1800s, really, it can date this to 1849 with a specific uh, individual, a plainest movement, uh, you know, as in earth being a plane, starts to emerge among Anglo-American Protestant fundamentalists. And the first figure who really uh, emphasizes this is a guy named Samuel Robotham. Uh, he's a failed member of a commune in England. Uh, so after his commune fails, he first makes the transition into uh, quack medicine. And then from there changes uh, again into promoting the flat earth. He writes a pamphlet in 1849. And really all modern flat earth ideas like come from this 1849 pamphlet. So he really is uh, the patient zero. And a lot of these flat earthers in the 18, early 1900s take on pen names. His name is Parallax. So a lot of times you'll just see you know, the writings of Parallax get written, uh, but it's referring to uh, Samuel Robotham. Uh, so he advocates uh, this uh, and uh, he comes up with a, a term called zetetic astronomy, which is his term for flat earth. Uh, a term that became popular, the, the term zetetic becoming popular a generation earlier as part of these uh, religious debates in Scotland about you know, the role of a free thinking and atheist advocacy. So he takes what had been you know, a term for essentially you know, the promotion of three, free thought against religion and starts using it you know, as free thought against you know, uh, secular education. Which again is interesting because he had been a utopian socialist, but finds that there's kind of more money in converting to this very explicitly uh, Christian interpretation, uh, a literalist interpretation of the Bible. Uh, him and his followers uh, are very famous for this 1871 debate with Alfred Russell Wallace, again, who is an early supporter of Darwin and the theory of evolution, so tying in kind of these ideas of Christian interpretations of the Bible versus uh, scientific views with what's called the Bedford level experiment, where essentially along this long straight canal in England, which was actually located right next to Robotham's old commune, which is where he first comes to know of it. You know, the idea is that if you have a telescope at one end and a flag on the other end, because of the curvature of the earth, you should you know, see part of the flag is obscured so Wallace takes up this bet of the flat earthers of measuring, you know, the Bedford level, and ultimately Wallace is uh, uh, proven correct. Uh, although, of course, the black flat earthers do not accept this, which again, uh, there's a Netflix documentary called uh, Behind the Curve about modern flat earthers, which came out a few years ago. It shows some people in, uh, I think it's California and along a canal there recreating the Bedford level experiment. And again, it shows them you know, demonstrating that, you no, know, you actually can't see the other flag because it's below the curvature of the earth. And then basically in real time, you see them convincing themselves about why their experiment was wrong. So again, it's because this is not a scientific view, it's a religious view. It's hard to really uh, convince these uh, uh, people about this because you, know, you can't really challenge faith with reason. Uh, I say that without judgment. Uh, but uh, Parallax himself dies in 1884. So by that time, one of his main followers, William Carpenter, uh, emigrates uh, from uh, the UK to Baltimore, where he sets up a uh, uh, kind of shop right near Johns Hopkins University and becomes famous for kind of you know, going into the university and like disrupting events or trying to hand out pamphlets. So he would try and first sell flat earth pamphlets and then just try and give them away if no one would buy. So he was a you know, notorious figure on Johns Hopkins. But by the time uh, Carpenter arrives in Baltimore, there's already a very strong flat earth movement in the upper south uh, of the United States at that time. And it's one that comes uh, from uh, slave preachers or formerly slave preachers. Uh, now, I have these two figures up here because 
first John Jasper is a major uh, figure of uh, uh, African American slave preaching and later on uh, multiracial preaching after the Civil War. But Benjamin Banneker uh, definitely is not. Uh, Banneker uh, is a freed, uh, he's a free black man who lives uh, in uh, the 1700s in Maryland. Uh, he, there's some research on his uh, father uh, and grandfather from the other side were both you know, brought over from Africa, freed in uh, colonial Maryland. And there's a, some uh, studies about how uh, Banneker's early knowledge of mathematics and astronomy show African influence from his father and grandfather's West African heritage. Uh, Banneker goes on to be a major uh, uh, you know, scholar in early America. He plays a role in uh, uh, laying out the, you know, the grid pattern of Washington, D.C. and surveying the new capital. He also puts out a very popular almanac. Uh, and so uh, one of the arguably one of the foundations of modern American astronomy comes from Benjamin Banneker, uh, not just from a black man, but from uh, the African knowledge he himself inherited and imparted. Uh, although it's outside the scope of this talk, I'll point out the origin of American paleontology likewise comes from uh, African heritage in South Carolina also. But again, that's beyond this, so I won't get into that. Uh, so on the one hand, we have you know, the start of kind of scientific astronomy in the early United States coming from Benjamin Banneker. Uh, John Jasper is you know, the start, arguably the start of the true American flat earth movement. Uh, so, uh, he does actually meet up with uh, 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 William Carpenter in Baltimore at some point, but by then Jasper is inarguably the leading flat earth advocate in the US. Uh, he was born in slavery in Virginia. He becomes a preacher at the end of the Civil War. You know, with the end of slavery, he helps set up a, uh, uh, a church in Richmond, a church which actually preaches to uh, a multiracial uh, congregation as well. Uh, and according to Jasper's biography, uh, he encounters a, a white parishioner and a black parishioner arguing over the shape of the earth. And from this, John Jasper, you know, reads the Bible and comes up with the conclusion that the earth is indeed flat. And he goes on this widespread speaking tour. He's an extremely popular speaker, uh, not only in Richmond, but on tour as well. And because of his advocacy of the flat earth, because there's so many people coming to pay to listen to him talk while on tour. He's able to not only you know, build a major congregation, but fund a lot of uh, uh, you know, African-American relief efforts, not only in Virginia, but in Africa as well as part of uh, the Church Missionary Society. Uh, and you know, it's easy to say that Jasper is kind of looked down upon, or you know, that it's you know, uh, this person who probably isn't, uh, uh, you know, wasn't taken seriously. He himself was taken very seriously by uh, Blacks at the time. Uh, for example, the biography I mentioned of him was written by Edwin Archer Randolph, who was the first African-American law graduate of Yale. Uh, Alex Haley in 1960 wrote a 50-page draft biography of Jasper for Reader's Digest, although it's rejected. Ralph Abernathy cites him uh, in his uh, biography of the civil rights movement. Uh, Henry Louis Gates Jr. Uh, links him as part of the tradition of African American preachers that goes to Martin Luther King. And the core of this is that for Jasper, the flat earth, you know, it's not just you know, a literalist interpretation of the Bible. The core is he's interpreting it from passages that have a heavy resonance in liberation theology. Uh, the core aspect for Jasper comes from a passage where God stops the sun uh, for the Israelites in their war against the Canaanites in the book of Joshua, which in the years after uh, Reconstruction in the South has particular resonance for Blacks as a, uh, a liberation uh, passage in the Bible. So again, the flat earth uh, ideology for Jasper, it comes out of uh, you know, specifically a, a political, uh, you know, a positive uh, you know, interpretation of the Bible, and he's able to use it to raise money to support his congregation. Uh, I should point out that uh, also in Baltimore, besides William Carpenter, there's a number of other uh, prominent uh, figures, including uh, the Reverend John Nelson McJilton, who's the director of the public school system uh, in Baltimore, 
who join the Flat Earth Society that Carpenter sets up. But McJilton is also very prominent in supporting African American education. There's a number of uh, Northern Civil War veterans, now specifically Northern Civil War veterans, who join the Flat Earth Society that William Carpenter establishes. So there is this pattern of you know, support for uh, you know, Black education, support for Black political rights, which gets associated with Flat Earth advocacy in the US South uh, at this time. Uh, but even while Carpenter has emigrated to the US, uh, although Parallax dies in 1884, uh, there's still a strong core of support in Britain, which become organized around uh, a group called the Universal Zetetic Society, which is founded by this noble woman, uh, Lady Elizabeth Blunt, who you takes the, tames, the name Zeteo. Uh, her uh, kind of assistant in running it is named Albert Smith, who goes by the name Zetetis. Uh, the Universal Zetetic Society uh, has members across the British Empire, including a number of colonial subjects, settlers, army officers, as well as emigres to the British metropole. Uh, and this is kind of an important function. It's at the heart of this you know, world-spanning empire, which means not only is part of the uh, flat earth appeal at this point, an argument that understanding flat earth you know, geography is important to keep the empire running. Uh, you know, uh, the empire in their view requires you know, knowledge of navigation, knowledge of you know, geography and geology that they say only the flat earth can offer. But it also means that uh, uh, there's a complicated relationship because again, the empire you know, is promoted as you know, circling the globe. Uh, so there's some criticism of the empire that gets built into this as well. Uh, for example, a lot of the members of uh, the Universal Zetetic Society become involved with an organization called the Society for the Protection of the Dark Races, which is founded by John Edward Quinlan, who is a flat earther. He's a land surveyor from St. Lucia. He emigrates to the uh, 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 to London. He joins the Universal Zetetic Society. He gets Lady Blunt to endorse the Society for the Protection of the Dark Races. There's another uh, emigre from Jamaica, uh, Emmanuel von Mulgrave, who's a preacher who gets involved. Uh, and so there is this uh, uh, sentiment of uh, flat earthers in London around the turn of the century who get invade, uh, engaged in very progressive uh, uh, you know, race relation advocacy, you know, very strong criticism of the British Empire's racial policy, especially in the West Indies and South Africa. Uh, and their criticism of uh, British policy in South Africa has particular resonance because of the structure of uh, South Africa at the time. So the country that we now call South Africa was at this point in the late 1800s divided between kind of two different areas. There's the Cape Colony, which originally had been settled by the Dutch, then taken over by the British. The Dutch settlers, or at least a large section of the Dutch settlers had fled inland to create the Orange Free State and the Transvaal Republic. So you have this kind of cold war between the two different uh, uh, white settler regimes in Southern Africa. Uh, and the Dutch uh, republics in particular, uh, the Boer republics after the, the term for the Dutch settlers are led by this man, Paul Kruger, uh, who's not only the president of the Transvaal Republic, but he's the father of the Dopper Church, which is essentially the state religion of the Transvaal. Uh, the Dutch who emigrated to South Africa are Calvinists, you know, very extreme uh, Protestant fundamentalists, and the Dopper Church itself kind of becomes an even more extreme offshoot of uh, the Dutch uh, reformed Calvinist church. Uh, the Dopper Church itself, uh, the term Dopper means damper because Kruger envisions the Dopper Church as the damper that's going to extinguish the light of the Enlightenment. So this is the mindset uh, of Kruger. And not surprisingly, Kruger himself is a flat earther. Kruger uh, supports uh, uh, you know, the idea of the flat earth. He writes in some of his you know, uh, biography about how when he's sailing uh, to London in the 1880s to negotiate with the British and he sees the stars changing overhead. So he kind of has to just go below deck and you know, tell himself that uh, he's not gonna look up, you know, have his faith tested. So again, 
he sees the evidence but can't really uh, explain it. Uh, so in the late 1800s, this is the condition uh, in South Africa when a certain American visitor comes uh, to visit. And this is the uh, second uh, local connection. So uh, Joshua Slocum, uh, he's actually from uh, Canada, I believe, but you know, emigrates uh, to this area. In 1895, he takes part in a voyage where uh, on his ship, the Spray, he's going to become the first man to sail around the world solo. Uh, and I mentioned he's a local guy. The Spray was built in Fairhaven, Massachusetts. Uh, he leaves on to depart on his voyage from Newport, uh, and he returns at the end of his voyage to Fairhaven also. So you know, if, if you just go across uh, New Bedford, you'll see the monument to Slocum and the Spray right, right near where uh, it was built and launched and right near where it returns from this voyage. Uh, so uh, from 1895 to 1898, Slocum sails alone around the world. In 1900, he writes his biography, appropriately enough, titled Sailing Alone Around the World. And in it, he describes this case where at the last leg of his voyage in 1898, he lands in South Africa. Uh, these three clergymen of the Dopper Church show up and you know, basically say, you say you've been sailing around the world, but we know that's not possible. So we want you to you know, recant. And he refuses. He basically gets into a fist fight with these uh, three uh, you know, Dutch clergymen. And then Later on, Kruger invites him uh, to have dinner before Slocum takes off again. And you know, Kruger says, oh, you say you're sailing you know, around the world, but you know, really you're sailing you know, across the world. And you know, Slocum doesn't you know, it's just, he writes up this, you know, this crazy Kruger about being a flat earther. Uh, this gets picked up by the British newspapers at the time in South Africa, especially because this is right at the start of uh, what's called the Second Boer War. Uh, or in the British view, the South African War, where the British go to war against the Dutch republics and conquer them. So Kruger's advocacy of the flat earth, as recounted by uh, Slocum, is part of this propaganda war by the British building up the justification to conquer uh, the Dutch, because again, they uh, because they're so religious, they don't really care about things like diamond mining. And so the British think, you know, if you're not going to, you know, strip mine the land, we'll take over your you know, republics and do it for you. Uh, again, that's kind of the underlying advocacy as well. Uh, but uh, in one of the British colonies in South Africa, Slocum also lands there and he meets another uh, uh, flat earther, a member of the Universal Zetetic Society, uh, who's British, not you know, Dutch. This is a guy named Thomas Winship, who goes by the name Rectangle. So you see a lot of writings from uh, Rectangle in the Flat Earth right, uh, journals at the time. Rectangle talks with Slocum and says, oh, you have actually been, you, know, you say you've been sailing around the world, but you never went over a curve. So therefore, you actually prove the Earth is flat. So in South Africa, you have these two competing views. You have the Dutch who think that Slocum it was faking it, and then the British who think that uh, Slocum is actually proving that the Earth is flat by his voyage. Uh, but for some reason, the British only really emphasize the Dutch side. Uh, but out of all this, uh, you know, the flat earther movement continues. Uh, whoops, let's see. Uh, in uh, eight or in 1935, Lady Blunt dies. But by that time, the Zetetic Society has gone into decline. Uh, in the U.S., there's a much smaller uh, uh, American flat earth movement at the time which also by the 1930s goes into decline. This was centered in the city of Zion, Illinois, uh, a bit outside you know, my focus, but if you ever read up on it, it's, a, it's essentially a cult town that was run by a group called the Theocratic Party, whose main emphasis was the earth is flat and uh, no smoking is allowed. And they beat up people who you know, rejected either of those views. But uh, Zion, the flat earthers basically lose control there by the 1930s also. And so there's this long-standing decline of uh, the Flat Earth organization in both the US and the UK and South Africa as well, actually. Uh, there's a small movement that starts in the UK under a guy named Samuel Shenton in 1956. When he dies in 1971, uh, the mantle gets picked up by these two people in the US, Charles K. Johnson and Marjorie Johnson. Uh, Charles 
is an American. Marjorie uh, was an uh, immigrant from Australia, where again, there's a major flat earth movement as well. Uh, they meet at a record store because they say they found out that, you know, they're reaching for the same record. And, you know, from talking about, you know, the record being a flat disc, they realized they were both flat earthers. So for the rest of their lives together, this married couple basically is the flat earth society as we know it from uh, the butt of jokes. Uh, a lot of their uh, uh, writings are online, which shows an interesting progression. Uh, they start as being fairly liberal, but by the end of their uh, 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 lives have become extremely uh, right wing. Uh, their argument is that apartheid fails in South Africa because the whites forget the flat earth lessons and you know the savage black you know africans are flat earthers and so that gave the you know blacks the ability to overturn apartheid so uh you can read a lot into that view that's one of just many very uh, strange very far right views they have uh uh but also you know because she's from australia they heavily repeat you know it really annoys them when australia is referred to as down under so there's multiple articles in their journal just about Australia and how it's not actually underneath the earth. Uh, so that's a major issue for them. Uh, but one of the interesting things is the modern uh, like idea of the moon landing hoax really comes from them. So the idea of you know people you know talk about skepticism of moon landing and the Apollo program that really had its genesis in the flat Earth movement in the 1960s, uh, which also means that. Uh, when uh, in the late 1970s, O.J. Simpson is in a movie, Capricorn One, that's essentially about the Apollo moon landing hoax. So then in the 90s, uh, Charles and Marjorie are very strong advocates that O.J. Simpson was innocent. So again, in the flat earth you know, journals, you'll see a lot of articles about you know, how O.J. Simpson is just being you know, prosecuted because he was gonna spill the truth that the earth was flat and you know, NASA was actually the ones who were framing uh, O.J. Simpson. So again, uh, a very interesting worldview and multiple uh, points for them. Uh, but uh, their house with all their records burns down in 1994. Marjorie dies a year later. Uh, by this point, though, their society basically doesn't really recover from that. Charles dies in 2001. But you know, essentially by the mid 90s, the last remnant of their flat earth society uh, uh, has collapsed. Uh, there's a much smaller one that's essentially just one or two guys who uh, set up uh, in 2004, but that's you know extremely uh, uh, small scale. Also, the modern uh, flat Earth movement as it emerges really comes across uh, from YouTube, uh, which launches in 2005. YouTube uh, inaugurates a new golden age of conspiracy theories. Uh, especially in the post 9-11 atmosphere. But the flat earth uh, really begins to thrive online in 2013, reaching its height in the 2015 to 17 period. And again, much like uh, uh, Robotham's 1849 pamphlet is really you know, the patient zero of the flat earth idea. Uh, there's uh, a guy, Eric Dubé, who makes a YouTube video in, uh, I think it's 2014. And that's really when you know, the modern flat earth thing comes out of that single YouTube video. Uh, one interesting thing is a lot of the modern flat earthers don't really know the historical like flat earth society, which kind of sets them apart from earlier uh, uh, trends in that. Uh, so the modern flat earth movement, again, is extremely generally uh, very far right wing, uh, and they tend to you know, be very politically conservative as well. Uh, Notably, not just in the United States, but arguably Brazil is really the major center point, uh, at least at least was of flat earthers, where uh, Jair Bolsonaro's 2018 election as president of Brazil was extremely tied to the flat earth movement. Bolsonaro's political uh, uh, mentor is a flat earther. He appointed flat earthers to be the minister of education and the minister of foreign affairs in Brazil, although I think they all kind of left uh, his government. So again, Arguably, Brazil was the leading uh, you know, flat earth movement uh, in recent years. Uh, again, there's a lot of overlaps with other conspiracy cultures, uh, especially QAnon. Uh, it got to the point where Q himself actually had to step in and say that the earth was not flat, which you can see here, which again didn't really stop his followers from uh, believing that. Uh, uh, so this 
uh, kind of goes to show how, you know, flat earth is not just an extreme idea, but it very much is connected with other extremely extreme uh, sentiments as well. Uh, but that's not only the case in uh, uh, the West you know, or in uh, you know, Latin America or uh, Britain. Uh, it's also the case in the Muslim world as well. Uh, so as I mentioned, there's a history of general Muslim acceptance of the Earth's shape and size uh, coming from their reverence for Greek knowledge. Uh, but as with Christians, there are a few exceptions throughout history. Uh, so Abdul Aziz Ibn Baz was the vice president of the Islamic University of Medina. Uh, he had used the Quran to promote flat earthism since 1966. And again, from there, three years later, he uses uh, that literalist interpretation of the Quran to argue that the Apollo moon landings were a hoax. Uh, Ibn Baz allegedly changed his mind after the Saudi prince Sultan bin Salman al Saud flew on the space shuttle in 1985. But even though he had to change you know, his support for the flat earth because the Saudi prince flew in space, uh, he apparently remained uh, convinced of geocentrism. Uh, and it's even after this where he gets appointed the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia in 1993. Uh, interestingly as well, there's a longstanding conspiracy theory in the Muslim world that Neil Armstrong converted to Islam on the moon because over the radio, he heard the call to prayer. So the moon landings have a, you know, a particular like uh, uh, a conspiracy reception in the Muslim world as well. Uh, but uh, the flat earth idea in the Muslim world recently kind of reached its uh, apex with uh, uh, Boko Haram, where the founder of Boko Haram, Muhammad Yusuf, was a flat earther. Uh, as far as I can tell, his flat earth views are unique among mod modern Sunni extremists, uh, even the Taliban. There's actually this you know, strange thing where Al-Qaeda itself had to you know, speak out and say that the Boko Haram acceptance of the flat earth was you know, embarrassing the you know, uh, Al-Qaeda. So uh, it's a, it really comes from the individual, but nevertheless, Boko Haram uh, in Nigeria was a flat earth movement, which uh, fed into why they specifically targeted uh, uh, geography teachers in Nigeria as well. Uh, but kind of the last, one, I think the one of the more interesting uh, recent developments was in 2017 at the University of Sfax in Tunisia, uh, where there's a student, uh, Amira Karubi, uh, who tries to present uh, a doctoral thesis in astronomy proving the Earth is flat. Uh, notably, her advisor, her doctoral advisor, was a professor named Jamel Torir who had also been a delegate to Tunisia's Const uh, Constitutional Assembly from 2011 to 14. Uh, this is particularly unique because this is an entirely secular argument for the flat earth devoid of religious context. Uh, it you know, tries to be a, a specifically scientific argument for the earth being flat, which as far as I can tell, this makes it really unique among not only uh, Muslim, but Christian modern flat earthers as well, especially kind of the more mainstream one. Uh, this, uh, the thesis did not pass if anyone's interested, but it became, you know, kind of a, uh, a big talking point. I think really if it hadn't been brought up and, you know, publicized, maybe it would have, I don't know, but it is notable that again, uh, a secular flat earth argument in a Tunisian university but also the professor who supervised this was one of the you know, people who helped draft the Tunisian constitution after the Arab Spring. Uh, and I'll point out, uh, keeping in the North African field, uh, I know a, a guy who's uh, getting his PhD at Hassan II University in Morocco named Chafiq Raigour, uh, and his work is on the modern Muslim flat earth movement in Arabic social media, which is also interesting because from what he said, the modern Muslim flat earth renaissance, which is very extensive, actually has very little to do with the current uh, flat earth renaissance in the West. It's really tied in with kind of anti-Western sentiments, anti-Christian sentiments, which you know, again is very hard to swear with you know, Western flat earthers. So it is interesting that you know, in the Western world and in uh, the Muslim world, there's this over you know, two kind of parallel flat earth movements emerging, both of them really emerging due to the booming of social media. Uh, but that's all I have. So I'm gonna end you know, this right here. Uh, again, uh, for those of you who are at Bristol, I'm in 
uh, Office E213. Welcome to come talk with me about this at any point. Uh, welcome to chat. Here, I'll, I'll bring this off. Awesome. <clears throat> awesome. Thank you very much, Eddie. That, uh, that, that lived up to all of my, uh, my hopes and expectations. It really is. It's just such a fascinating and uh, widespreading, <clears throat> the implications, the connections of something like this, it, it really is just flat out fascinating to me. So before I ramble and <clears throat> make a fool of myself, I'd like to open up everything for us to any uh, question and answer. We have, we have nine minutes left. I'd like to respect everybody's time. And we can always continue this conversation down the road, as Eddie just said, uh, directly, but also at the Lash Center, we're figuring out ways to make this so these events do not end this day. And so we'll be talking about that more. But right now, questions and answers. And I see Will has his hand up. So um, throwing it there. So, uh, Edward, thank you so much for the really fascinating talk. Um, I guess, question is like, at this point, are, is like, are, we, are the flat earthers? interesting or dangerous it's like like flat earth like where in the gateway drug between like you know conspiracy theory and you know dangerous antisocial behavior does it go is it like hey if you like flat earth theory do i have some nazi for you or is it that like you kind of have to believe in some crazy stuff before you get to flat earth yeah it's i think there's it's one of the things where if you believe in flat earth you're seen as kind of a you know easy uh uh mark for other theories. And I think it's also the fact that one reason why the flat earth movement has kind of gone down, you know, it's been less active in recent years is because really most of them switch their focus to, you know, COVID conspiracy stuff. I mean, there's a, you know, and there's been a lot of news stories, about, you know, like a lot of leading flat earthers dying from COVID because they're refusing to get vaccinated or, you know, wear masks. And uh, so it is, you know, definitely there's a lot of overlap with other views. Uh, I've read uh, some accounts of journalists talking about how you know, QAnon uh, recruiters are real active in flat earth conferences. Uh, but it's also the fact that uh, uh, the flat earth movement itself started to heavily recruit by you know, having posters go on like uh, militia websites and neo-Nazi websites. So it is kind of this thing where uh, the flat earthers, you know, kind of think anyone who believes certain uh you know, extreme or out there views are, you know, potential recruits, but those groups are thinking the same thing of flat earthers. I think in general, in a lot of kind of these conspiracy, you know, uh, mindsets, you know, it's not one single view. I mean, usually you don't find, you know, for example, people who just believe in UFOs, you know, typically they tend to also believe in, you know, Bigfoot and psychic powers and, you know, government cover-ups and all of this, uh, is a term, uh, uh epistemologically unsound beliefs or EUBs. Uh, there's an anthropologist, Jeb Card, who also has a term, uh, the paranormal unified field theory or puffed, where you know, essentially if you believe in one of these out there things, the odds are there's other ones also. Uh, there is one interesting development from uh, last year where one of the uh, major kind of longtime QAnon promoters, a guy named Dylan Wheeler, uh, actually rejected QAnon. So after you know many years being at the heart of QAnon, he rejected you know QAnon and he re you know he reframed himself as a flat earther. So there is at least one case where I guess flat earth has uh, pulled someone out of QAnon, but to what degree that has really changed his you know, views in other regards, I guess uh, is unseen. Do we have any? Other questions or comments or because I will certainly step up with my list. <laughs> uh, Robin, think, thank you. So really interesting, Eddie. Um, it, I I was under the misconception that, and of course, I you know I I knew about uh, the the early. Um, understanding of, of Greeks and, and others about the, the, the shape of the earth. And I hadn't realized though that, um, I, I thought that this flat earth, um, these flat earth ideas were, were recent. So I think your, your talk has really uh, opened up uh, some interesting points um, because um, 
you know, it, I didn't realize how old it was. I guess this is, I, I was connecting it with the more recent sort of anti-intellectualism that we've seen in, you know, maybe the past 10 years or so, uh, and, and just hadn't realized how old it was. So thank you. All right. Yeah. And one of the interesting thing is there is this kind of like, it does return in waves kind of like every couple of decades. Uh, and usually they're connected with kind of the previous wave. And I think this current uh, uh, you know, flat earth movement is kind of unique in that it doesn't really draw from any of the earlier flat earth currents. Uh, uh, again, it's, but there's also kind of interesting things too, where, you know, uh, uh, there's, you know, debates between you no know, flat earthers and geocentrists now, because they each think that, you know, no, oh, being a geocentrist is so ridiculous. It's harming the flat earth movement. A geocentrist thinking of flat earthers are so ridiculous. It's hurting the geocentrist argument. So you do have some of these, uh, uh, <laughs> there's a famous, actually, uh, you know, uh, in the chat, Will was talking about the documentary with Kate Mulgrew narrating about, uh, you know, advocating for geocentrism. The guy who made that documentary did go to one of the flat earth conferences a few years ago. There was a big debate you know, between him advocating for geocentrism and one of the big uh, you know, flat earth advocates also. I don't know yeah, who won I, that debate, but. <laughs> I think that's uh, Robin, I'm, I'm right there with you in a way <laughs> in even my understanding of history, I think kind of it goes back to that. Like I'm always surprised and always uh, intrigued by how, how these things come back up and then disappear again. It's not this one progressive movement towards enlightenment, right? It's like there's a few <laughs> steps forward, a few steps back. And I love the way that you are, that you started that off by saying, you know, all these people of all different faiths, all these different areas, they all kind of understood that the world was round. And here we go, like 1800s, <laughs> you know, here it comes again. So it really, that, that is fascinating to me. Um, any other questions, comments? No? Um, can I ask a question? Absolutely, Tim. So, I, thanks. Um, so Eddie, thanks for your presentation. It's really fascinating. Um, uh, I've had no contact with anyone who, um, uh, believes in the flat earth theory, except for one passing uh, contact, I guess. I, I used to live in Texas. I worked at a university there north of Dallas, and there was one house not far from campus. I, I think it was occupied by students, had these huge signs in their front yard saying the earth is flat and you know, all these things. And every time I passed by, I just got the sense that they were just trying to thumb their nose at people, just trying to cause a disturbance. In other words, it wasn't necessarily a deeply held belief. They were just... Um, being contrarian in a way. So I guess my question is, um, you mentioned earlier that uh, this belief tends to be associated with a fervent religious belief, especially extreme religious beliefs. Um, uh, but you also mentioned that uh, it's popular among other uh, groups at QAnon, which I'm not terribly familiar with, but I don't associate that as a religious organization. Um, are there other motivations that you've identified? Are there people who are just using this as, as a way to cause disruption, for example? Um, have you seen that as a major current? Yeah, I think uh, definitely. I, there was, it was actually an interest. You may have heard it was it happened just before the start of the pandemic, so it may have kind of been drowned out by that. But there was a guy uh, uh, who was you know, kind of well known for building his own rockets, and his argument was he was trying to build a rocket to fly up and prove that the Earth was flat. Uh, and he became well known because he crashed and you know, died in his one of his rocket tests. Uh, so again, that was like a very well known flat earther, and I know. Uh, a lot of people in the flat earth community think he was just, you know, in it just because, you know, flat earthers are, you know, an easy way to make money by, you know, getting donations to build his rocket. Uh, I've heard others say that, you know, he was a genuine flat earther or uh, interest or kind of maybe troubling enough that he may have actually started just as a way to, you know, get easy money out of the flat earthers and kind of converted, you know, from, so that's a strange uh, a thought also, but there are definitely at least some who think that it's uh, you know, an easy money-making thing, but I think that's also true for a lot of groups, like a lot of the anti-vaxxers, a lot of uh, 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 like the QAnon or like far-right Trump people, like well, any of those things. There's definitely people who are in it for just the money because they know it's an easy uh, way to way to you know as long as you know are saying like donate to me so we can help you know overturn the election. I mean, it, there's already you know people. Who, 
gone to prison because they've raked millions of dollars out of those movements and turns out they're <laughs> just lining their pockets with it. But I don't know if that makes it necessarily better or worse than you know, if they're our true believers, but uh, as <laughs> it's a, a mix. <laughs> Thank you very much, Eddie. This was, uh, an, again, an excellent hour. I think it really does go to show again, like, <clears throat> like the way that history lives and breathes in this really, when you, when you start seeing a, a large movements like this started by very human concerns. I, I always find that really engaging and interesting. And it really shows how much can be shaped by just a few people, a few ideas, and how it can ripple across, again, up and down in these waves uh, of influence. So I think that there's a lot here that can uh, be discussed in the classrooms all over the campus that we, that we have here. And it was really engaging. And so thank you very much. Thank you for a wonderful hour. This, uh, this video is being recorded and we will be hosting it on the LASH Center so people can come back to it. And like I said, I, I really do hope that we're able to continue this. Uh, you know, I know that Chris Erelis is really working on making this so this doesn't just end here, but we're able to continue down the road. And so Eddie, you'll certainly be hearing from me again. And I thank, I thank you everybody for attending. And I hope you all can still get out and enjoy this 60 degree weather I think that we're having right now. So bye everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.